I love the story behind movies. This is one of my favorites. It didn't get a lot of hype. It's not dinosaurs that Steven Spielberg did or E.T. or some big. It's just an average kid that, that takes a lot of money from people. Now, there's other names in it. You know, Tom Hanks is in it. And I want to spare you of my Christopher Walken impression, okay? But watching this film reminded me of somebody in the Old Testament that I read a thousand times as a kid, heard stories of, who was running from who he was supposed to be, who he was called to be. And that man was Jonah. You could take this lesson at any, any age-appropriate level. You could take it as that preschool, elementary, story time, Veggie Tales movie of a Jonah being swallowed by a big fish and going to Nineveh with the fish slappers, as they were called. Or you can take these four little chapters that were some of the most powerful, if I let it. I brought my back up just in case my electronic version of my scripture fails on me. But in Jonah, as you know this story, more than likely, he's told to go to a town called Nineveh. To proclaim a word, mind you, this, this message that he was told to preach was only eight words long. Eight words to a town of over 120,000 people. Jonah decides, I'm not going. A couple of reasons that were guessed why he chose not to go to Nineveh. But the one that I'm going to be stemming from today is the fact that Jonah... It wasn't the fact that Jonah thought that Nineveh wouldn't listen to him. That they, not that they wouldn't shun him out of the town and say never come back and laughed him out. It was the fact that Jonah knew that they would listen. He knew that God is a forgiving and a graceful God. He knew that. But he knew and he held in his heart that they don't deserve it. That they don't need forgiveness from God. They've done too many evil things pagan things that they don't deserve what God has to give. That's why he chose to go away. The rest of this story is of him running away from a chance to preach the gospel. And he's on the boat headed to Tarshish. When the storm came, you all know this story. And they asked him, they asked Jonah, what is it that's causing the storm? And the question was, who are you and what have you done to cause this storm? It came to that, they cast lots and came down that Jonah is the issue behind this great tragedy, the storm. He finally chimed in and said, it's me. I'm not doing what I need to be doing. The only way this is going to end is if you throw me over. Well, back and forth, they eventually tossed him over. As soon as they tossed him overboard, the storm calmed. Well, they didn't just pull him back in the boat and all all was fine again. They praised God and gave sacrifices. They worshipped God at that moment. Jonah is running away from a chance to preach the gospel to a town of 120,000 people and these six or seven men on this boat, he can't get away from preaching. He can't get away from God being proclaimed the good news being shared, and people responding. He finally makes it to Nineveh after spending three days in the belly of a fish. By the way, side note, a preacher friend of mine said, someone asked him, how in the world can you believe a story so outlandish as this one of a man being swallowed by a fish and three days later be sped up on the side of the shore and moving on? His response was this. He said, if I can believe in the story of my Lord and Savior, whom we crucified, and buried in the tomb, and later, three days later, rose from the grave, I can believe in a lot of things. As awesome as the story of Jonah is, it does nothing to the power of the story of Christ. Amen? Nothing. A three-day journey while he's at Nineveh. Three-day journey in the fish. 
he's getting a second chance of redemption again. Because he's once again faced with the dilemma of these people do not deserve what you have to offer them. When Jonah's message, which was eight words long, his word was, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's his message. He took an entire day's journey just to get to the heart of the city and say those eight words, 40 more days and this town will be overthrown. When that message finally got to the king, the whole city eventually, it, says, it even says sackcloth and ashes, and worshipped God, threw down their idols, worshipped God. Jonah went up to a place above the city where he could see everything play out. Like, just go ahead and do what you came to do. Just smite them, just kill them all. Because I know what you're going to do. You're going to forgive all these people. Like He still can't get over what is in his heart about what he believes that people don't deserve. I can go on and tell the story of the vine, but what I, what I want you to get from this, I think the reason that I chose this lesson is, is personal for me. You see, I was a bitter person for a long time. There were people in my life that I didn't think that deserved to hear God, the gospel. People that I sat in the same church building with for years that I thought did me wrong and that don't deserve it. How can I effectively ask for forgiveness on my end when I won't even forgive my brother sitting across the church building? Do I deserve it any more than this person does? Am I any greater? Not long ago, I, I decided enough was enough. And I'm, I'm starting down a personal road of forgiveness. And I hate to say that some of my personal struggle comes from, Jerry Don said, my years in ministry. How could I hate my brother in church? This is, this is ministry that I was doing. How can I have animosity and tension to a brother in a church that I've worked with? Could you say the same thing about a brother and sister that you worship or have worshipped with in the past? That you don't feel like you could do it justice to sit in an auditorium and praise God without worrying about what they're doing or why they're here? I don't mean to hit a nerve but this is one that is hitting one with me. I've made a, a short list. You're not on it, so you're fine. A short list of people that I have needed to forgive. Amanda's been with me in those times when I've made those phone calls. And I've sent those text messages. And I've said the things that I've needed to say for so long. And by that point, some of these people are like, Man, I've been over that for 10 years. It's fine. I love you, brother. And I'm like, I needed to say it. Because it was killing me. I can relate with Jonah. It was easier for me to say, well, that's enough. And I just take off and I run. Or I just ignore you like you're not even sitting next to me. I can handle my own world here, me and God, and listen to the sermon and go home. I can handle that. It's only a couple hours every week. I'm not completely through my list of people that I need to call. I've got a few more left. I'm not ready. So my sermon to you is, your, my challenge to you is also one that I'm working on myself. Is how can I accept the grace of God, forgiveness that He offers, when I won't even allow myself to give it to somebody else who needs it? How? It was so, my anger for an issue or a person became so bad that I was on two different medications for, ang for anxiety and depression. I could not, because of my anxiety, I couldn't stand in front of a place like this and give you a message like I'm doing right now. It would tear me up so much that I'd, just, I'd have to just quit and sit down. Anxiety. Those of you that have not faced it don't understand and those of you that have know exactly what I'm talking about. 
it can disable you completely. Frank Abagnale Jr.'s redeeming story was that after being captured and sat in an overseas prison for years because of what he had done, later the FBI gave him a chance to work alongside with them as the Czech Fraud Recovery Program. He later established, this is the true story, by the way. You can look up Frank Abagnale Jr. and he will tell you the same thing word for word. This is a true story. Abagnale and company firm that is a check fraud. Like all of our, all the numbers at the bottom of the check, they're there for a reason, partly because of Frank Abagnale. His redeeming story where he's able to now help people. And Jonah's redeeming story twice of the fish and then the city with, with the vine. But I have my own redeeming story. My story of forgiveness, not only of other people, but of myself. Things that I may have done that I'm not happy with. You may be sitting here with pain of something similar to my story. You may have pain from divorce. You may have pain from financial trouble. Fill in the blank. This is part of your fish story. Your chance of being redeemed is coming. Are we going to continue to run and not face what I've been called to be? It was said that I can outrun my calling, but I cannot outrun my caller. He'll catch up to me eventually. This little story, four chapters in the Bible, mean the world to me. And others like it. My message is simple. And that is forgiveness. We talk about it. And it's okay for me to talk to you about, you need to forgive that person. If you've been hiding something deep like I've been for years, and it's eating me alive to the point to where I can't even function, you've got to stop. My caller caught up to me. I don't have a lot extra today. That, that is my lesson. That is my message. It means a lot to me. I could talk forever about how much my family has saved me and, and my anxiety. But I didn't have a nurse for a wife to be able to see the signs of anxiety or tell me when I was doing something stupid. I love that woman. And for God to show me that in, in our journey of my wife, Amanda, my son, Isaac, I'm sorry, I mentioned you. You can kill me later. My daughter, Madeline, that God was trying to tell me a message. What well, spelled out, A I M, my focus, my aim, should have been my family the whole time. And not worry about this piddly stuff. We are family. I'm glad to be here. I've had, I wear a mic most Sundays, but I'm not up here. I'm usually in the back singing. Um, I'd like the chance to get to know your families as we continue our journey with, with, with you guys. Um, we're thankful to be in Darnell. Thank you for the chance to speak this morning, Howard and Jerry Don, Kent. Um, I'm going to pray us out. If you need to respond in any way, I'm not going to have a formal invitation. It's an open invitation. It's come find an elder. Come find me. Come find someone that you think it needs to hear your story, that needs to pray with you. If what you need is baptism, we've got it ready. Let's take care of it. If you need a study, if you don't feel like you know enough, if you feel like you have those financial issues that you want counseling on, we've got a CPA here. We've got people that can help you with that. Whatever your issue, your need is, it's what family is for. Instead of turning against each other, let's focus inward. 
I can't follow the two commandments that God gave me of love Him and love His people if I can't stand some of His people. I'm not doing the second commandment. Let's pray and we'll be finished. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank You for uh, this beautiful day that You gave us. I woke up with the blue sky and the birds singing and, and everything green. God, and I'm, I'm thankful for what You've given us. Father, I come to You this morning with a message of, of forgiveness and redemption on my end. And I hope, Father, that You see me through on that. I also ask that You bless the, the hearts of the people here in this room in this body of church that's not even here today, that if we need that redeeming story, if we need your love and forgiveness and grace, that we come to you. <clears throat> it's in your son's name that we ask this. Amen.